Well, good afternoon and welcome to This Week in Leadership. Uh, I'm Todd Sears, I'm CEO of Out Leadership, and I'm excited to welcome you to this week's episode. Uh, we'll be chatting with my old buddy, Jonathan Capehart from the Washington Post and uh, diving deep into all things that matter from Lady Bunny to his childhood to the Pulitzer Prize to race and politics in the world today. Um, before we uh, dive into that though, I do wanna, as always, thank a few people. Uh, I'd love to thank all of the Out Leadership member companies, all 80 of them who support our work and make the work that we're doing around the world possible, but also these vodcasts. I wanna thank HSBC, EY, KPMG, RBC, Greenberg Traurig for their support of Out Leadership as global sponsors. And as I do each week, I wanna thank a few of our key members and call out a few of the 80 member firms to thank them for their support. Uh, this week, I'd like to thank Capital One, Goldman Sachs, Hogan Lovells, Paul Weiss, Sherman and Sterling, Skadden, KKR, Apollo, PayPal, Morgan Stanley, Prudential Invest Investment Management, or PGIM, and Buckley Sandler, or Buckley LLP, as they're now known. I want to thank them for their support about leadership um, and for supporting all of the work that we do, including these programs. So with that, I want to, uh, I'm not going to give you too much of a bio background because we're going to dive into who he is and what's made him the leader he is today. Um, but I'm excited that Jonathan Capehart has joined us. Um, I had the pleasure of getting to know Jonathan in the late 90s, date to be determined, not shared. Uh, <laughs> we've been friends for a very long time. Exactly. You know, when, when, when we were five um, and um, we have aged beautifully and gracefully. Um, Jonathan is a brilliant writer. He's a brilliant speaker. Mm -hmm. He does a great amount of TV on a, almost on a daily basis. Um, and he's kind of at the intersection of race, politics, sexual orientation. He's interviewed everybody from the Obamas multiple times through to uh, Maxine Waters to you name it. He's spoken to them and they love him. Uh, so I'm excited that he's going to join us. Um, and so first of all, Jonathan, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you very much, Todd. And um, thank you to uh, Out Leadership and everything that you do. I think the last time the last big adventure I had with you guys was the big trip in uh, Hong Kong. Well, you've been many times. I went that one time and have not forgotten it. It was such a great conference and such a fantastic location. So it's wonderful to be back with you all. Well, thank you. And you did an amazing job. It was very fun to, to host you in Hong Kong. They, uh, they still talk about you at the upper house. So, uh, <laughs> Good, because I want to go back. <laughs> I know, I want to go back too. Uh, we missed them. Um, so, um, so let, let's start at the beginning. Let, let, let's start back when, when Jonathan Capehart is growing up. Um, let, talk to me one about childhood briefly, but, but specifically on the LGBT front, I'm always fascinated when people start to understand who they are as, as a gay man or a gay person or an LGBT plus person. When, when did that sort of start for you? When did you start realizing that you were potentially a little bit different than the other boys? <laughs> well, I was 10 years old. I was 10 years old when I when I figured out that yeah I liked boys. And I remember I was staying with my uncle one summer in in his wife in Virginia down uh, in Newport News and I was reading some religious tract that was in the bathroom and I saw something about men laying down with men and I was like oh really <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. This, this is this is rendered in the negative, but oh, that just hit me in the heart. Uh, and so that's when, I, when I started thinking back, I thought, you know, I've been feeling this way since I was ten years old. You know, I was born and raised in New Jersey. Uh, we lived in Newark until I was ten, and then we moved to the suburbs. And then my mother remarried and we moved, and he lived in Newark, and so we moved back to Newark. And it was sort of the ultimate, not the ultimate. It was my version of Fresh Prince of Bel Air, but in reverse. I, I had become Fresh Prince of Newark. I see. Yes, I had become this, you know, preppy suburban tennis playing black kid who is now living in Newark. And I said to my my mother, and then soon to be stepfather, now ex stepfather, um, that it, they needed to find a private school for me to go to in Newark because I was not going to public school because I'll get beat up. And that's exactly the way I said it. And so 
I ended up going to St. Benedict's uh, Preparatory School for Boys in Newark. It uh -huh. is a phenomenal school, really, a phenomenal school. Uh, 60 Minutes did a great profile on the headmaster a couple of years ago, Father Ed, or as mm -hmm. some guys called him, Fred. Uh, but, you know, it went to school 11 months out of the year. It uh -huh. was rigorous. Wow. So that by the time I went to Carleton in Minnesota, I was surrounded by people who were drowning in work. They had never seen, had that amount of work before in their lives. And I was yeah. like, I was like this, excuse me, I'm going, <laughs> I'm fine. I don't know. I got you. I'm fine. Uh, so, so those are my, my early years. So, so going back, so you knew you were 10, who did you tell? How did you navigate that? I'm always like, Oh, I didn't tell anybody. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. It wasn't until college that I actually came out and I came out really to my friend, Matthew Brooks, who is still a very dear friend. He was a soft, I was a sophomore when he was a freshman and mm -hmm. he looked just like George Michael. Right when George Michael was at his height uh -huh. in the, the 80s. He had the earring too? He did, yes, he had a little earring, not the, but not the, the, the okay. right. And so we just hit it off. And so I, basically came out through my friendship with him. Hmm. And so he then became the person over like five years or so at Carleton. Anyone who came out between the years of 86 and 90 came out to Matthew because he was the only visible out loud and proud gay person on campus. Wow. And so he then took over the Gay Student Union, moved it out of the basement of the chapel into a room upstairs in the, the main student union. It uh -huh. went from having maybe five people who were members, including myself sneaking in, um, ballooning to at one point like 30 people. And at one meeting, I looked around and I said, where have y'all been? <laughs> um, and so it was like, it was at Carlton through talking with Matthew and our friendship and, um, and through all those meetings that I started feeling more comfortable in my own skin and started telling friends around me who were wondering like, where did you go? You've disappeared. You're hanging out with these different, these new people. What's yeah. going on? And I'd say, here I am. And they're all like, oh yeah, I can see that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wait, isn't that the worst? Like yeah. when they're not surprised, right? Yeah, not surprised. They're like, mm-hmm. Glad you figured it out. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> you <begged. laughs> you begged. And what about your family? When did you tell them? So I did not tell my mother until I came home from college. So after college, I after graduation, I um, worked as assistant to the president of my of Carleton postgraduate year. And so I didn't come home until I graduated 89. I did not come home until 90. By then my mom divorced um, the stepdad. We moved back to our old apartment in Hazlitt, New Jersey, which I'm so glad I convinced her to keep for just for that very reason. Yeah. Because I knew that wasn't gonna last. Anyway, it's not about my mother, it's about me. Um, <laughs> Mr. York, gone. Um, and so we were sitting, I was sitting on my futon and my mom standing in the doorway and, and basically I maneuvered my mother into asking me if I was gay. Because I could not just come right on out and say it. And so I said, I was talking about, you know, this position and that position, political position. And then I said, and then, you know, lesbians and gay men. I don't understand. Like there are neighbors and doctors and teachers and everything. And I don't understand the hatred. My mother looked at me and she said, well, are you gay? And I remember sitting on my futon feeling like everything shining on me. And I was like, this is it. And I just said, yes. And she, you know, basically did a pearl clutch, 
and then asked, why? <laughs> I don't know why. Um, and so that's because of those Bible verses. And when I was like 10, they were saying, I should have done the Bible told me so. Um, oh my God. And so that was 1990. It took a while because my mother is a, you know, born again, Bible toting Christian. Um, certainly, certainly, I, certainly I've my seen the I've seen the interview. I, I haven't met her, I don't think, I, but I've, I've seen the pictures and heard the stories. Yes. And so she, it took a little while, but, but she came around. And meanwhile, the other members of my, my father died when I was four months old. But the other members of, of the family, as they, you know, found out, you know, for some it was it was unacceptable, but for everybody else it was just fine. And also, they all knew. They all knew. Come on, we all know. You take a look at you. You take a look at your kids or your friends' uh -huh. kids or nieces and nephews, yeah. and you're looking. You're like, mm -hmm, talk to me in about fifteen years. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm here to guide you, young Skywalker, through what you need to know and how to navigate and how to make your way in this world. Uh huh. Well, so let's take that for a second. I had a gay mom when I was coming out in the '90s. Did you have a gay mom? Somebody that taught you the the wilds and the worlds of the gays? If anything, I mean, probably Matthew. Yeah. My, yeah. It's my Actually. college best friend Matthew. I mean, he yeah. he was the one. He was so. It wasn't that he taught me the ways of the world, like in in because when you say gay mom, you, I'm thinking of an older gay man who's about 20 years older. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been a gay mom for some for some yeah for some folks, but with Thanks. Matthew, he was the 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 one who just by his example taught me a lot. Um, he was comfortable in, I mean, was, he is comfortable in his own skin. He was confident yeah. in his abilities. He was confident in the contributions he could make um, either at the school as a student, but also in the world just by being. And for me, that was um, incredibly inspiring to see that it was not something to be feared. You needed to be fearful because people wanted to do you harm, but there was nothing to be afraid of in terms of your character, your moral bearing, uh, anything when it comes to being gay. I think that's amazing. And I think if you think back to when we were coming out, that, you know, you didn't have any of the visible role models that we have now. We didn't have the internet, right? We didn't have, I mean, this is what we're talking the fifties here, you and I, right? I know. I mean, basically, basically, oh, or think about it this, this way, the characters in the movies and on television, remember glad and other organizations were, were yelling at Hollywood and saying, stop showing us as tragic creatures, as people who, because we're gay, have to kill ourselves. Yeah, or die of AIDS, like that was it. Right, and so, you know, when a, a television show like Will and Grace comes along and basically just shows like, here we are, matter of fact, or even before Will and Grace, when you had golden girls who were yeah. willing to push, at the time, push the envelope on what yeah. it means to talk about gay people and and portray them. Um, th this world today, um, still as perilous and troubling as it is, um, young gays is light years, light, light years uh, better in terms of outreach and access and um, and cultural markers. Yeah, that we had. Well, Hollywood, as we were just saying, right, on Netflix this week, right? I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, Hollywood, as I said to you, in the green room. And then, exactly. In, in the um, Illusions Lounge. Exactly. Uh, interior Illusions Lounge. Interior okay. Illusions Lounge. Yeah. Ooh, uh -huh. Way back, season one. Um, <laughs> Vaseline Lens, which we have right now, by the way. I love it. I, I love it. any Zooms that are a little blurry because I look so much younger. It's awesome. <laughs> I, I was going to say, um, in the last episode of Hollywood, I just, I cried from beginning to end. 
And one, because I think the stress of what we're going through right now with isolation and COVID and life not being what we used to know it to be, yeah. but also what I was watching. Hollywood, I know there, there are critics of it, but what I loved about Hollywood is that it showed what Hollywood was, but also what it could, what it could have been mm -hmm. if people had shown the courage and the strength to do the right thing. And that's what, I, that's what I loved about, and then in the last episode, when you had the Oscars ceremony. Don't, don't ruin it for me. I haven't seen it yet. Oh, oh, you know what? Oops. Alert, alert. Okay, in, you already started it, go ahead. In, no, 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 man, I can't give it away. Oh my God, I do this all the time. I'm always, <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm not spoiler guy. So uh -huh. never mind. Anyway, Hollywood, it's great. Uh, <laughs> it's great, moving on. Okay. Uh-huh. Well, but, but you know about the portrayals. Exactly. It's all about the portrayals and the fact that there are a myriad of them and that they're constant and they're integrated. It's like sex education on Netflix. I thought that was amazing because it's got a major gay theme, but that's not the point of it, right? It's not like an after school special like we used to have. Like now it's the you know, the after school special of the gay kid coming out. Everything is integrated, which is I think so important. Mm -hmm. which is what I think you do a good job of in your day-to-day -day life, right? You show up as a black gay man in every circle that you come into and you bring that into your work, which I wanna talk about. So sure. let's, so you, you, you graduated from college and did okay, came out to mom, then what's the, what's the next step in the life and journey of Cape Verde? Oh, then I left. <laughs> I, I moved to yeah. New York City. Okay. Yeah. Six months after moving, moving home, I moved to New York City to yep. Jane Street, my very first apartment in New York City was on Jane Street, and um, being able. Oh, sorry, I don't yeah, know. Who, I don't know who that is. It's not the Obamas. Take it. No, no. Although I don't know how to stop it from ringing. Go ahead, we'll no, 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 I keep trying to hit, like, don't answer. Anyway, we're all about to find out who it is. I can't wait, we're gonna hear the message. Is that an old school tape, like, answer machine? Well, it's it's digital now, but we had to, but we had to get, we had to get a landline because um, our apartment is like a concrete box and cell phones, depending uh -huh. on who you are in the apartment, the calls were, will drop. Anyway, I moved to New York City. <laughs> you got your bunker. Go on. I moved to New York City and just start living and making uh -huh. friends and finding and finding my way around. And I met my first long-term boyfriend, who you knew, Giuseppe. Yep. And we were together eleven years. I mean, as he likes to say, you know, we were both puppies. We were still finding our way and learning, but it was such a wonderful time to um, be in New York, be gay in New York, uh, to be with someone who was beautiful and who loved me. And then the great um, friends that we were able to make in those years, uh, it's, I had a very positive experience of being of, of coming out, being in New York City, living as a as an openly gay man, uh, even at work, a couple of times, you know, I, you know, we always we're always coming out, right? So Every even day. though we've come out to family and friends, depending on the situation, we always have to come out. And my first job at WNYC, I was assistant to the president, and um, my boss invited invited me to the weekend house with him and his wife. And, you know, oh, if you want to bring, you know, if you're dating somebody, you can bring them. And I just looked, I was like, um, Tom, um, you know, I'm gay. And he was a little taken aback. And then he, he tells me the next day, he tells his wife. And his wife was like, Tom, I knew that. 
<laughs> so you know that was wonderful. He and you know he was a Carleton grad. That's how I got my job. He was Carleton class of '49, and um, heard I was looking for jobs in TV in New York or Washington. And he had been appointed by Mayor Dinkins to run WNYC. So I took that job. Then fast forward, I go to the Daily News in New York mm -hmm. on the editorial board, and I'm pretty much brand new. This is now, that was 93, around 94. Okay, so hang on a second. You went from assistant to the head of WNYC to on the editorial board of the Daily News. Mm -hmm. I, I neglected to mention the point that, that point that out. That's not a normal thing that happens to most people. And I, I had a one year stint in between because I left WNYC to go to the Today Show as a, as a researcher. I was an intern on the Today Show in college and then I took a leap. I took a, I, I took a big risk. I left my permanent job with health benefits at WNYC to take a three month vacation relief job at the Today Show with no health benefits, but sort of still the same pay. I ended up staying for just shy of a year because I'd been hired by the Daily News. Uh, to be on the editorial board. Um, Mort Zuckerman had just bought the paper and yeah. he wanted a young person who could write for the editorial board, meaning cheap labor. No, exactly. <laughs> I'm like, great, fine, I'll do right. it. Right. So my editor, the man who hired me, if you can imagine this, is a cross between Steve McQueen and oh. Ed Harris. Oh. How you doing? So, How you doing? Okay, thank you. Sign me up for that. So I was like, you came what? out to George Michael, and now you're working for Steve McQueen and Ed Harris. Ed Harris. So, yes. Great. So, um, so they hire me, and this is right around the time in night. That was ninety three. So ninety four was the time Giuliani's now mayor, and he's cracking down on unsafe sex and gay bathhouses, movie theaters around yeah. the city, and so. Um, the West Side Club opened up and yeah. Gabriel Rotello, who was writing for Newsday at the time, and I was reading the papers and I remember opening up the paper and going, oh, he went on a tour. That's amazing. And he wrote about it. Damn him. How did he, how did he beat me to this? And so, how did he beat me to, I mean, it? Me to this? So I said to, I said to, um, in the morning meeting, I said, you know, Gabriel Tella has this thing, da, 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 da. And my editor said, well, why don't you go do the same thing? I was like, oh, excuse me? Uh, 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 sure. So I tell Giuseppe to call the West Side Club, get this, call the West Side Club and arrange a tour. Stop it. Yeah, so just- Now wait, for our viewers who don't know what the West Side Club is, because we do have some people that may not be in New York City or may not be of age to know. The West Side Club is a bathhouse that was for me outrageous at the second in the second wave of the HIV epidemic. It opened a half block away from gay men's health crisis. That's right. It was, in, that was, it was bananas. crazy. So, I know. so Giuseppe calls and makes an appointment for us to go for a tour at seven thirty that evening. We show oh. up, and the the guy at the front desk is like, um. Yeah, we're so busy, not gonna be able to give you a tour. And so I turned to Giuseppe and I was like, I have to get in there. And so we pay our money, take off our clothes, put on our towels and start walking around. And amazing, living the life. So fast forward the next day, I get into the office early and I'm now writing, I write this piece. And then I hand it to my editor, a column. And he comes out of his office. He is beat red. He is so red. And I walk in, and my the the deputy is there too. And he's like, "Um, this is good, but <laughs> it is. It's a little cold. You're not. I mean, for this to work, you've got to talk about your experience." Like, did anything happen there? I, and I looked at him and I was like, you want me to put that in the piece? <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, 
Okay, so I went okay. back to my desk for it. and I put in some flavor, and ah. he ah. and then he was like, oh, oh, okay. "Okay," and so then it goes in the paper with the headline: "Getting undressed, going undercover." Ooh, that does have flavor. That's saucy. Now, before that, before that happened, though. Again, I was writing these editorials about the bat, about the movie theaters, and my editor. I wrote this editorial. My editor comes out, and he's reading the he's reading a printed out copy, and he's sitting next to me in in a chair right here. I'm at my desk, and he is now going on and saying, "I don't understand it. Why are young gays doing this? Why are they not listening to the older gays who have lived through, who lived through the first wave?" And who are like yelling and screaming about this? Why don't they listen to them? Why? Like he's asking all these questions, and I turned to him and I said, um, "Arthur, before I answer that question, I need to ask you a question. I need to tell you something." I said, "You know I'm gay, right?" And he doesn't even look at me. He just looks up from the paper and looks straight ahead and he goes, "Did I know for a fact? No. Did I suspect? Yep." And that was it. And we moved on from there and he kept firing all these questions at me. But it became this moment where un my mother had said to me, don't tell anyone you're gay because it will ruin your career. My and dad said the same thing to me. And here I was sitting with my editor at a major New York City newspaper, having just come out and, and it's not a detriment, it's actually the the positive that it's supposed to be and brings out a voice at the table that had not been there maybe before. And so I've been very lucky to work at institutions and for people for whom being LGBTQ is not a deal breaker. It's not an issue. It's not a problem. It's an asset. And all you had to do was write about gay bathhouses to come out. I mean, simple. <laughs> you know, maneuver so that someone has to ask. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I love that point, Jonathan. I had the same experience in my career, right? When I came out on Wall Street, I was one of the first people to be visible and I created the first team and it was an asset and I used it as an asset. And that's exactly what, what you've done as well. So, so Daily News, editorial board, you continue on, you, you you happen to write some pretty interesting journalism that maybe some prized people took a look at and said, hey, maybe she needs a big award. Let's talk about this. So we, uh, there was a story in the Daily News about a fight between Congressman Charlie Rangel, the Dean of the New York City Congressional Delegation and Harlem Powerhouse and Mayor Giuliani over funds in the empowerment zone up in Harlem and over the Apollo Theater, which is a, a national treasure, just about every old school black entertainer you know was discovered there. Yep. So um, my editor said, hey, how about we go take a tour of the Apollo? Because we like to get out of the building and go around. So we go to the Apollo, we look around, and this is when Showtime at the Apollo was the big show after Saturday Night Live with Amateur Night at the Apollo and, and all of that. So we thought the theater was making money hand over fist. Turns out the contract for the show was not, no one was getting rich off it. The theater was being robbed of its potential. Mm. We get there, the theater's a wreck. Paint peeling from the ceilings, broken seats, everything was terrible. And so I started, we started asking questions. And one question led to five questions, which led to five more questions. And so over the course of, a, of two months, we, my, Michael Aronson and I did a bunch of reporting and we wrote a series of editorials. And we were doing it because we wanted to save the Apollo Theater, not for anything else. And lo and behold, my editor decided, eh, let's, toss it in there for Pulitzer consideration with a bunch of other stuff that we've done. And come to, he comes, so the, the way the Pulitzer board works, it's a two-step process. 
there's a larger board of about 100 people. And okay. then there's the actual board. Then the 100 people, they call the, the submissions down to four. So there's wow. a winner, and then how there's- How many are in the submissions? Hmm? How many are in the total submissions for a, for a general it, Pulitzer? It, it, oh, who knows? I mean, it, de it depends, but mm. it's a lot. And so lot. people winnow it down, and then the board, uh, the Pulitzer board, then decides who the winner is. My editor at the time was part of that larger board and was judging cartoons and stuff. And he's on an elevator. He said he was on the elevator with this woman and they introduced themselves to each other. He says, oh, I'm Michael Goodwin from, uh, I'm the editorial page editor of the, of the Daily News. And she had a bunch of stuff in her arms and he said she clutched them to her chest and said, I can't talk to you. And so we were thinking, wait, is it for CUNY, the City University of New York stuff that we'd been writing a lot about, or was it the Apollo or was it something else? And so he then went back to the main room where all the submissions were laid out and CUNY was still there, but Apollo was missing. So now we knew that something was up. The following, I think it's like the next month is the week the Pulitzer board comes to town and they meet. Um, in between finding out that we were a finalist and then that meeting, I could not hold any food down. I was a wreck. And so the day that we knew they were meeting, my editor went out to lunch. We were all crazed, throwing Nerf footballs around and just trying to work out the energy. And then the phone rang. Uh -huh. the phone rang and his assistant answered the phone. And then she said, he's not here, I'll take a message. She takes the message and she tells us who it was, which only told us, we're gonna know who, we're, like this person's gonna tell him whether we made it or not. My yeah. editor was out at lunch way longer than he should have been. Uh -huh. So now, by the time he comes back, we are on fire. And he goes into his office, we thought, call him back, call him back. And now we're watching, um, back in the old days, you had the phone where you could see all the extensions. And so we watched it. The phone. Yeah, we watched, we, we watched the light light up. And then within 10 seconds, it was dark. And so now we're freaked. My desk was in view of his office. And every morning for our morning meeting, he would emerge and nod at me. And I would scream out, meeting. And that let everyone know it was time to meet. He comes out of his office. He looks at me and he tells everyone to come in. And so I yell out, meeting. And I go into the office. <laughs> he, different person, but he is beat red. He looks pissed. You have this impact on lots of your bosses. I, Jeez. I, I know, but this was not my fault. So I, I go into, I, I lay down on his sofa because I can't take it anymore. We're finally all in his office. He is behind his desk. He has his hands in his pocket. He is beat red. He turns around with his back to us. And we've seen this before, so we're all a little like, oh shit. He then turns around and takes his hands out of his pockets and goes, we got it. I went from horizontal to scraping the ceiling in a nanosecond um, that we had won the Pulitzer Prize. It was unexpected. It was the most glorious day to find it. that day was the most glorious day. The, the actual ceremony a, a month later or so, I mean, that was nice. But when you get the news, it's it was just, it was spectacular. That's amazing. That's so cool. So how did that change your life? Um, well, it changed my life in that it made people, not that people didn't take me seriously before, yeah. But when you when you have that prize, it is it's something that makes the the industry pay attention, your your uh, colleagues pay attention, mm -hmm. um, and what's the irony of all ironies, my current editor is one of the people we beat that year. Wow, yeah. So that went over real well when we first met. <laughs> Was your your current editor beat red? 
as well? Is that a no? No, no, he was not beat red. I see. Yeah, that is amazing. Now, just to, from a demographic perspective, how many black gay journalists have won the Pulitzer Prize before? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure. I'm sure. Are you? I cannot possibly be the only one. I am almost certain that I am not the only one. I just don't. I just can't think of any right now. We should do some research on that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so you've won the Pulitzer, you're doing amazing work. Let, let's talk about today. Let, let's talk yeah. about, you've got like nine jobs, right? Cause you're like on the TV, you're on the joy up, you're on the Cape up, you're talking to people on the vodcasts, on the radios. Um, give us just a scope of the work right now. And then I want to talk about some, some hot topics. Sure. So right now, the way the industry is, you can't just be on one platform. In the old days, it was you were either in print or you were on television or you were on radio. You could not be, if you cross over to one, you can't be in the other. That right. is, those days are gone. And so if you are like myself, a print reporter, you need to have another outlet for your work. And so you go on television, you go on radio, you hope that one of the networks signs you on and makes you a contributor. Um, and I've been a contributor at MSNBC, a paid contributor since 2009. So, um, so those are, that's why, I use, yeah, I, got a, I have a lot of jobs. And then you throw on top of it, substitute hosting on the radio sometimes, moderating panels, um, uh, giving speeches. It is a, in the old days, like pre-Rona days, it was a constant, a constant churn of, I'm in the office, I have to be in New York, I have to be in LA, I have to go over to Europe, I have to, and making it, or Hong Kong, and you have to make, you have to make it work. Uh, mm -hmm. I look back on those days of crazy travel and being in like four cities in 13 time zones in seven yeah. days with, I'm like wistful for those, I know, same. <laughs> for those days. Um, so, so that's the nature of the job these days. Well, so, which I think actually makes a lot of sense because there is such an interconnection between the topics that you're tackling, right? I mean, you can, right. You can write an article about it and then talk about it on MSNBC and then you can do a blog post about it and then talk about it on your podcast and probably leverage the conversation that you create across the platform. So I think that's. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. And there was something I said on Joy's show over the weekend that I've been meaning to, Joy Reid of MSNBC, um, that I've been meaning to write, but I've been doing my VP piece for the last four days. But I said on television, as we were talking about the Ahmad Arbery case in Georgia, the young black man who was yeah. killed because these vigilantes thought he was a, a thief. As you, we were talking about what it means to be African-American and an African-American male in the country. And I talked about how, you know, I never leave home ever, even if I'm going down to check the mail without three things in my pocket, my driver's license, my health insurance card, and my business card with my husband's name and cell phone number, number on it that says in case of emergency. Because of what's happened, what happened to Trayvon Martin and Walter Scott, and um, now Ahmaud Arbery and uh, Jordan Davis and Tamir Rice and on and on and on and on. And, on. Yep. and so I thought, you know, that's actually something I need to write again. And I had interviewed Benjamin Crump, who is a, a lawyer for the Arbery family. Uh, he was the lawyer for Trayvon Martin's family. And wow. so I talked to him about the parallels, the similarities between the two cases, and they're really eerie. And so um, I'm mentioning all this to talk about how all of these things are re self reinforcing, which yeah. is a lot of work, but it actually makes work uh, a lot easier. Well, so let, let's talk about the Georgia case and let's also talk about you and your personal intersection here. One of the things I, I want to explore is, is what it is, what it is like in the current world to be a black gay man. Um, and one of the things that I'm always interested in is sort of, the intersection of the different hats you wear, right? You know, mm -hmm. with what you just said, one, I've known you for a long time and I didn't know that you carried those three things with you. And that's 
heartbreaking and upsetting and crappy, but also totally smart, right? And in the same way, if you go to parts of the world as a gay man, you would have to have the same protection. Um, and so like, how do you, how do you sort of navigate the different identities that, that you have? Well, in the job that I have, my identities are part of the job. Um, yeah. when you are an opinion writer and when you are an editorial board member, you are bringing your perspective either culturally, racially, socioeconomically, you're bringing it to the table. And so I have no choice but to be the, the black gay guy at the table. The one saving grace, however, is um, at the Washington Post, I do not have to be, I am not the only person who worries about the LGBT community or who worries about the African American community or who worries about both communities with the same fiery passion that I do, which actually is a relief because then that means I don't have to pay attention to it if I'm focused on something else that I need to write, which is, which is wonderful. But when it comes to, when it comes to big flashpoints like the Ahmad Arbery case, yeah, being able to say with authority to people, here's what it's like, here's what it means, right. um, is uh, not something that I, I it, it's not a position I'm in that I take lightly. I remember when Trayvon Martin happened and I wrote um, the, my first piece where I said to people, you know, my mom had the talk with me. At that point, no one knew what the talk was except right. black people. And I wrote, you know, here's what I was taught. Don't run in public. Don't run in public with anything in your hands. And there are a bunch of other, a bunch of other lessons. And I was just writing from my heart and just putting it out there, not expecting it to have the impact that it had, the number of emails that I got from people, especially from black people saying, I got the talk at 10 years old. I got the talk at eight years old. I just gave the talk to, to my six year old and I'm frightened and I'm, and I'm scared. Or the reaction from white people who said, I had no idea that this was a thing. Yeah. I had no idea that black parents were doing this. I had a colleague at MSNBC who pulled me aside tears in her eyes and said, oh my God, I cannot believe that, you know, she said, it would never occur to me to say any of those things to my 16 year old. And the right. fact that your mother and mothers today are still having to do that is hard. Right. That to me was um, when I sort of was reacquainted with the, the power of my voice, but yeah. also, the, the, and I hate the way this is gonna sound, but the power of my example, and by that I mean, I have an audience of people who read me, right. and trust me, and so, and who might have, and who have a vision of me and my life and my cares and concerns that are, you know, one way. Right. And then for them to hear that, oh, little Mr. Ivory Tower, Jonathan Capehart, has to worry about all of these things, not only did it bring me down to earth for them, but it, it showed them that someone they trust mm -hmm. and as I found out care about is going through something they need to pay attention to. And that to me it is what makes this job worthwhile. Well, and it's that you are not, not just an example, but you're open, honest, and authentic about your life experience. And you're willing to share that with people, right? Because if we don't talk about our experiences, how will people know? And they will assume Ivory Tower, Jonathan Capehart, super smart, Pulitzer Prize winner, has it all and has no concerns. And to your point, that's that's not the case. You know, one of the um, wonderful things is talking about just authentically being myself. I was on television and I was just talking about, at the time I said, you know, my partner, just because I was talking about my partner. And people lost their minds. Like, oh my God, did K-Bart say he has a partner? Wait, he's gay? Or, oh my God, I can't believe he actually said that on television. Then, um, you know, we go, we go to Italy, come back. I had proposed to him. 
Hardball did a segment on it. Other shows that I went on celebrated celebrated us. It was incredible. Fast forward a, few, a couple of years, and I just happened to casually mention, you know, my husband and I, or my husband, and someone tweeted, I know he's married, but every time he says my husband on television, I, I just get thrilled or something like that. To another people mention how just having an, an openly gay person talk about their husband as if it's like everybody else does yeah. was something that they, that they treasured. And that's why I said, you know, hearkening back to what I said earlier about how today it is infinitely better than it was when, you know, we were coming up in New York in, in the mid 90s yeah. to be able to talk about my husband. Um, the fact that I actually have a husband because it's now legal in, yeah. in the United States um, and to be able to do so without fear of retribution at, at work. And to have that be, as we all are in our positions as openly gay people, and have that be an example for someone who's either a generation or two behind us or within our own generation who's looking for that last bit of courage to be true to themselves. Yeah. I mean, again, I mean, that's what makes all of this worthwhile. Well, it's a privilege, right? I mean, we, we should be grateful for the work that everybody did the 30, 40, 50 years before us, right? Exactly. Would not happen. We would not have the privileges we enjoy were it not for them. Right. And think about this, Todd. Back in, you know, Frank Kameny's day, um, yeah. when, you know, he and, you know, the other lesbian and gay men who were protesting down at the White House, carrying picket signs, when it was illegal to be gay in the federal government, you could lose your job as he did. Yep. The amount of courage and bravery that took is, I mean, what they did, what we're doing now, standing way atop their shoulders, pales in comparison to the risks that they took just so that you and I can kiki and guffaw here as openly openly gay men in 2020. That's exactly right. And you know, it's interesting when I talk to them, like the Peter Staley's of the world, right? Who from an AIDS activism perspective were the people that were throwing ashes of AIDS patients on the White House lawn and being arrested. And, and you know, when you talk to them and you share with them the impact that they've made and you talk about why, to a person, they almost said, we didn't have a choice. They were just driven. They had to do what they felt. And I think that's that's so interesting because now people do have a choice um, because that they felt they didn't, but then people don't always make the choice to leverage the platform they have to make change. And I think that's that's why it matters so much that, that you use the platform that you have to continue to make change just by being you. Uh, well, thank you for that. You know, I wanna address um, this comment here, and I don't know how many people can see it from Jonathan Wilson saying, there's still a lot of work to be done. Yes, it's better than it was. Many people of color, LGBTQ people are still suffering. Absolutely. Yeah. And this celebration is by no means um, a way of ignoring the work that is still to be done. I mean, I look at someone like Congressman John Lewis, who got his head cracked open on the Edmund Pettus Bridge fighting for the right of Black people to vote. And here we are, all these years later, 50 years later, having yeah. the same fights. Same fights. So, and losing. Yeah. And, and yes, and losing them. And so yeah. what the lessons that we should take from what's happening now is that liberty and justice and equality are not, I mean, they are goals. Yeah. But those are goals that must be fought for. And when they are won, must be fought for in order, in order that they be maintained. And so using the successes of the past, reveling in where we were as a way of pushing us forward to where we, where we want to be um, is something that we all should do. We should never be satisfied in the moment that we're in. You know, I, I remind people that we were never more 
American. And this nation was never more America than on June 26, 2015, when the United States Supreme Court made marriage equality legal in the United States. And then that night, the White House was ablazing in the rainbow colors. Yeah. Not just by happenstance, but because the president of the United States said, let's do it. This is a way to celebrate this enormous victory for, for justice and equality in this country. And now look who's living there. And now look where we are and look at what he's doing to LGBTQ people in agencies throughout the government that we're not paying attention to because of the crazy at 1600 and coming yep. from the Oval Office. So, you know what, I will, I'm not gonna apologize for, um, not that anybody asked, but I'm not gonna apologize for reveling in the advances that we've made, but um, I'm also mindful of how much work we have to do just to maintain and hold on to what what we have. Right. Well, and I, two thoughts come to mind, right? One, it, it, equality is not a permanent state and it is not an end state, right? It, it continues to be needed to be pushed forward. And as you were speaking, I was thinking about the, the line from Angels in America where Belize, the, the black gay man in Angels in America, the nurse talks about the fact that the man that wrote the Star Spangled Banner put the word freedom on a note so high nobody could reach it. <laughs> right. Right, like I, I think that's that's kind of how I look at it as well. So yes, let's celebrate, but let's use that as fuel to make sure that we're pushing forward because there is still so much. I just chatted yesterday with Kathleen Sebelius on our little vodcast and oh, yeah. health and human services, right? And the rollback of so many of the administrative provisions. She put in 250 administrative positions that were LGBT friendly on everything from people being able to visit their partners all the way through to being able to take care of partners in nursing homes and funeral homes and all those sort of pieces, including families and adoptions. And so many of those administrative pr pr provisions have been rolled back in the last three years. And, you know, she said, the good news is they can be fixed. Mm -hmm. um, let's, we've got just a couple minutes left and I want to focus on that. So they can be fixed. I think most of the folks in our orbit would agree that the way to have the crazy leave 1600 Pennsylvania is to have someone not crazy and smart like a Biden, for example, uh, in that office uh, and potentially with an interesting VP pick. So let's 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 discuss if, if you're if you're crystal ball and I understand that Michelle Obama said no. Uh, I, I think more like a hell no. But hell no. Hell yeah. no. Uh, who, who's it going to be? Is it going to be a woman of color? Is it going to be, you know, is it Stacey Abrams? Who is it? Um, well, I just wrote a piece this week that said, you know, Biden needs a black woman as his VP. Mm -hmm. And um, and I made the case that, you know, winning this, the Midwestern states that Hillary, Hillary Clinton lost and appealing to black voters are not mutually exclusive. Mm. That, you know, folks keep focusing on the fact that we got to win back Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. And that's when I have to remind people, but you know, Detroit is in Michigan and Milwaukee is in Wisconsin and, Pen and Philadelphia is in Pennsylvania. And right. Michigan, Wisconsin, it, uh, hold on one second, because I'm gonna pull this up. I'm gonna pull this, graph, this, this chart up right now. Yes, the black turnout in Wisconsin in 2016 dropped 19%. Wow. Um, percent um, in in Michigan it dropped in Michigan it didn't drop as much dropped 1.2 percent but get a load get a load of this had black turnout remained at its 2012 level um, hold on where is it I'm trying to find there's this incredible number in terms of in terms of stats okay the Detroit Free Press reported days after the 2016 election that in Detroit, Clinton won roughly 50,000 fewer votes than Obama did in 2012. You know how many votes she lost Michigan by? 10,704 votes. Wow. And so wow. my argument is you put 
African, well, African Americans are the, the foundation of the, of the Democratic Party, the most reliable right. and most loyal voters. Yep. You've got to ask for their vote. You cannot take it for granted. And you have to, ex you excite the Democratic, you, you, if you excite African Americans, you excite the, the, uh, the uh, African American base, you excite the Democratic Party base. You pull them out to vote. And um, you put someone, there are four black women that I'm writing about in a new, in a new piece. Stacey Abrams, Congresswoman Val Demings, yeah. Senator Kamala Harris, and former National Security Advisor Susan Rice. All yeah. four are being talked about. All four are worthy of, of the, the speculation. Um, yeah. But if you, if you were to push me, Okay, I'm gonna tell I'm gonna tell you because here's okay. piece. Bring it in, bring it in. Kamala Harris, I think, should be the vice presidential nominee. Yeah. She's a senator. She has won two, well, first she's won two local races as mm -hmm. the attorney of San Francisco. She's won three statewide races in California, yeah. um, two for um Two for AG, one for for senator. She was the attorney general of California. Um, yep. She has run for president already, so she knows what it's like. The other yep. thing is uh, is that she, because she's from California and the governor is a Democrat, if she were to if they were to win, right, it'd be okay. It, it'll be okay. You don't. You have a Democratic governor replacing the Democratic senator. I could tell you. I could tell you more, but you'll just have to read about it when it finally gets That's out. Bad. The teaser, uh huh. Yeah, that's, that's some teaser. that's some clickbait, uh huh. <laughs> How is it clickbait if I told you what the end of the story is? <laughs> I was looking. You got me. You drew, you drew me in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love it. Well, Jonathan, we are almost at our time. Yes. Time she flies. I know. Uh, so I, I'm a chatty Kathy. Well, that's okay. Well, I know. That's that's why I invited you. So cl closing thought, what's the, what's the positive you see coming out of this disaster we've been going through? I'm, I'm asking everybody this question. What's the, what's the sil not, not silver lining, but all the things are changing. What is, what's the positive thing that you're excited about coming out of this? I'm in addition to lockdown. Well, I'm ex I remain excited by the, the, the next generation. And by next generation, I'm talking about the, the um, Parkland kids. Mm -hmm. The activism, the overall activism we've seen in this country, but the fact that you have the Parkland generation as fired up as they are, as intersectional as they are, um, as wide-eyed as they are, when they burst onto the scene, it was one of the one of the first times I felt hopeful about the future of the country, and I remain hopeful. I love it. And they're continuing to do great work. And so many other people have been inspired by their activism. So I think that's, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Well, in closing, Jonathan, I, I want to share with our, our viewers a little something that I, I did in honor of our chat, just to, to keep it a little, uh, <laughs> <laughs> wearing these platform heels, our, our entire conversation, simply because I know that that matters. And I know that that visibility, authenticity and pain is, uh, <laughs> is, is important. Um, so it, in seriousness, thank you. Thank you for your visibility, for your friendship, but, but most of all for going on every single day and representing our community, communities of color, and hopefully continue to help change the world. So thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you, Todd. Thanks very much. We'll see you soon. All right.